So the point tonight is to make a couple of comments to start us off. So we, we know where we're trying to go with this uh, series of slides on that are going to be on the wall behind me here. The revelation, the fifth ethical revelation, presents, I guess you'd have to say, definitely, the greatest challenge to mankind that's ever been put before us. It's a, an extreme challenge. And that that's reflected in how it came to be. A group of individuals in the universe were commissioned to take the totality of reality, to take infinity, and condense it down into a book that we can hold in our hands. That in itself, just the quantitative aspect of it, should remind you of what kind of a challenge they put in front of you to try to really take yourself from where we all begin on this benighted sphere, very ignorant, we all begin hopelessly ignorant, to take yourself from that state to where they would like to lead you. Um, uh, you know, even uh, Jesus foreshadowed this. That, you know, he said, I find you in this very limited state and I would lead you up to recognition and realization and appreciation. And then upon that new foundation, that new objective foundation, you can discover the true love that you have always known was possible. So, what exactly? What are the specifics of that? What, I mean, when I say it's a, it's a huge challenge, um, not just that quantitative, but the qualitative. There's a quality of consciousness that the relatives are challenging us to at least begin to discover. A quality of consciousness that mankind has never even remotely imagined was possible. Um, you know, they tell you that, that we're quivering on the very brink of an age when we're all going to be really, really challenging ourselves um, to have greater and greater quality of thinking. And this is the means. The fifth ethical revelation is the means to that end. It doesn't just happen magically. Someone just, just flick a switch on high, and boom, we all have quality of thinking. So how do we go about that? Let's just slowly work our way into that, that specific issue of how can I be, uh, like I alluded to this morning, how can I begin to make that transition from the firm knowledge that I'm a child of God? How can I get myself through adolescence and start to really try to be a growing adult of God. It's not gonna, you're not going to be a very advanced adult anytime soon. But how can you really start that process? Um, of, you know, remember how it tells you, uh, God wants you to start as a child, but he doesn't want you to stay there forever. He wants you to start moving as soon as you can. Okay, so... That thought right there on that slide is, is, is the spark to start it. Logical consistency versus personal creativity. First thing we want to, okay, I, I can tell you that that's the beginning, but you know, it doesn't mean anything, it's just a set of words. Where do we start? How, what does that really mean? Let's dig into it. Let's go to the first slide. Personal creativity. Because we're all given a personality, as soon as someone says creativity, that should spark some thoughts in your head. Even the children of God have some pretty definitive thoughts percolated, percolating about personal creativity. Specifically, where does it come from? Personal creativity is an expression of your individual relationship with God the Father. Like I said, it's coming from personality. That individual, one-on-one, -on -one, absolutely no one else in the universe except God and you in that individual relationship. God the Father and you. 
Let's look, look at this little passage of how the relatives uh, speak about that incredible individual relationship. Personality inherently reaches out to unify all constituent realities. Such unifying creativity of all creature personality is a birthmark of its high and exclusive source and is further evidential of its unbroken contact with this same source through the personality circuit by means of which the personality of the creature maintains direct and sustaining contact with the father of all personality on paradise. Well, that's, that's a heck of a lot more than anyone has ever spoken to the truth of that relationship between you and God the Father ever. That's a pretty incredible revelation. I mean, look at high and exclusive source, direct and sustaining contact. Okay, I'm told that, and I'm thinking, whoa, um, maybe I'm really, really something amazing in this universe. Uh, maybe I'm already an adult of God. That sounds, I mean, if it's a high and exclusive source and it's a direct and sustaining contact, I, I mean, it must be dumb already, right? No, but just because of that, is your creativity therefore divine? Are you really done when you start? The moment you choose to recognize that you're a child of God? What else does it say? Personality is inherently creative, but it thus functions only in the inner life of the individual. It is the creativity of the inner world that is most subject to your direction, because there your personality is so largely liberated from the fetters of the laws of antecedent causation. There rests upon each person the responsibility of choosing as to whether this creativity shall be spontaneous and wholly haphazard or controlled, directed, and constructed. Okay, well, it's pretty obvious what the answer to that previous question was. Creativity is not innately divine. There rests upon... Okay? You must choose its conformity with the cosmos. Yes, you have this incredible potential for personal creativity, but you must choose. And look at this, this note as we go forward. Remember some of the things they were alluding to right here. Words like responsibility, control, personal responsibility, self-control. And that's the real key behind that little uh, warning they're, they're putting out there about this incredible gift of personal creativity. Okay, what about this conformity with the cosmos? What does that mean? And why did I word it that way? You know, I don't see those words exactly there. Let's see. Let's go forward. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. 